Hello, my delicious co-creators. Lilu here. I'm in south of France in beautiful grass with a, a seagull. Can we say, how do you say this in English? Circadius. <laughs> they're singing, they're lovely. It's a be such a beautiful area and I'm really enjoying my time with you here, Marion. Mar Marion is, this, uh, is a friend of a friend and we got to know each other. And uh, I'm quite amazed by this woman, strong woman. You used to be this type A, overachieving, very successful businesswoman. And I want to speak today about this shift that you have encountered that, that kind of happened to you, <laughs> no? And, and how you um, are now, uh, what, what, what is your recommendation mainly about this self-sabotage, this, because I feel a lot of us uh, are living this, you know, are, are, are into our fear and we're feeling stuck and, and we're keep on attracting the same thing over and over again. So I think you have a lot of elements uh, and a lot of uh, even exercise or tools, can we say, or, or obstacles. You, you wrote the book Shift, the 12 keys to, um, to, to shift your life. You wrote this with, uh, with, uh, with Tracy Latz, and you, you wrote a few books with her, actually, but yeah. this is... Yeah, we've written three books together, and what we're trying to do is encourage people to take back their power, to understand that they're responsible for everything that happens in their lives. They're not victims of anything yeah. or anyone else. Yeah. So we've developed a series of tools and tips to empower people yeah. and to become their own gurus. Yeah. Uh, my journey was very interesting. I was a pretty fast-paced, uh, beginning in, in corporate world with the Bank of America for a while. Then I set up my own business at the age of 26, and I ended up having major clients in, in my business like Adidas, Mack Truck, Snap-on Tools, Michael Kors. I did a lot of corporate licensing of patents and trademarks, new inventions. And I loved it, and I was good at it. I wasn't very good at relationships, but I was great at business, so that's what I focused on. It was go, 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 uh, type A. Sort of like you, nonstop. <gasps> Boom! <laughs> no, it's, you know, you never knew which country I was in. It's like trying to follow you on Facebook. Yeah. You don't know where anyone is because they're moving so fast. But was I conscious? I was so distracted by business, by sports. And uh, something really remarkable happened. I used to go to the gym every day to stay in shape. I thought it was to stay in shape. But it was because I felt so guilty about eating and drinking and having a good time that I used to punish myself. And over time, after being in the gym, I was aching and I could do less and less over time. I was, my body was locking up. It was telling me, do something different. But of You're course. not really hearing it, huh? because I heard like at this moment you had this shoulder block, and that's really where there's this huge shift that happened for you. Huh? It took me about 10 years before my body was shutting down every, uh, you know, the right shoulder, then the left shoulder, my knees, and I was becoming immobilized by my own distraction. And I found out later that your body loves you so much that uh, it'll do anything to tell you to wake up. And I started waking up only because I couldn't move anymore, and I couldn't travel and, and do the sports that I like to do and live the life I wanted to live. And I think this happens with a lot of people, but they don't wake up. Yeah. They I, just get sick. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like this suffering that we need to finally wake up. And here the, the, your body told you your shoulder was locked. You tried to find a solution. And then you bump into Philippe Coffin that I have already interviewed actually back in Switzerland. He's this healer, but he didn't have this life. You knew him from the banking world or tell us? Well, Philippe had been living in 36 countries. He was sort of like us. He had been living in multiple countries over the years working with Schlumberger and then he was an investment banker with Chase. He was the last person in the world I would imagine would ever become a healer. And what was a healer? Anyway, I was walking down the street in Paris, and I had my coat over my shoulders. It was about 20 degrees. It was cold. And I ran into Philippe, and I hadn't seen Philippe in at least five countries. And he said, Marion, what are you doing? Give me a hug. Couldn't raise my arm to give him a hug. He said, you don't even have your coat on. What's going on? And I told him, and he said, come to my place. I can heal you. I said, when? Uh-huh, baby. <laughs> yeah, you've been trying to get me to your place for a long time. What do you mean you can heal me? What does that mean? Anyway, I went back to his place with him. He waved some tuning forks over me and did some energy healing. And after two rounds of all kinds of anti-inflammatories, which didn't work, 10 minutes with Philippe relieved my pain. But he said, 
Your body loves you so much it's telling you something. Listen, it's going to come back if you don't do something about your thoughts because your thoughts are directing your body. Every thought you have talks to every atom, cell, and molecule in your body, and it responds. You must have been quite shocked at hearing him say this and, and having this whole experience because you were not there yet. You, oh, I, I, mean, thought he, I thought he was nuts. Yeah. I said, Philippe, thank you for healing me, but I've got a schedule to keep, you know, I keep going, keep going, keep going, all this distraction. He said, you'll be back. Two weeks later, the other shoulder froze wow. and I couldn't move. And I called Philippe. He said, now do you get it? You really need to start working on yourself. You need to change your consciousness. You need to grow up. Your body loves you and is talking. Listen, most people walk around deaf, dumb, and blind. Don't be one of them. Mm. And it was true. Yeah. You got really interested then into, can we call it energy medicine, uh, into this, right? Because, because right now I'm, I'm, I'm hearing and I'm seeing you going all around the world and learning, keep on learning. Like there's this, this uh, unlimited <laughs> thirst for, for knowledge to understand how this, the body works, how this universe works. How? Yeah, I started studying everything, quantum physics, energy medicine, color and sound healing. I went to an ancient mystery school called Delphi University in McKaysville, Georgia, which is in the middle of redneck country, and it's a very difficult place to find. And I went there because Philippe had recommended I go. He said, you want to find out how healing works? Go to this place. Little did I know that the first week was an intensive week of mediumship. How to become a medium. I like things medium rare. I mean, I didn't even know what a medium was. They were talking about avatars. I, and I said, what's an avatar? And they said, what are you doing here? Yeah. And I said, I wanted to heal my shoulders. I wanted to be able to heal myself without having to go to a person like Philippe or a healer. So... Uh, and you did this in parallel? Are you still practicing uh, international licensing and all absolutely. that? Absolutely. It, it, was, it wasn't easy because I was uh, doing about 12 hours of courses a day and then I was up half the night trying to catch up with my work. And after every course, my friends would say, oh, I looked up on the internet what you were doing. That must have been weird. And I said, you know, it was really wonderful. Do you want to learn something about it? And I would teach what I learned after I learned it. How do you think uh, all this fits in, like your, your I w I'm going to say your past career and now what you're doing and how you're supporting people, removing, going beyond the fears and really shifting their life? How, how is this? Because it feels like you're, this, you're a strong woman and sometimes we need, you know, this, this kind of, this, this strength, this education, you know, the knowledge, the, 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 this international experience. Like I, I feel more in confidence when I, when I have somebody like that working on me or that I'm working with. Well, I'm coming from a very left brain sort of corporate world, working with major corporations, working with doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, people that aren't necessarily what you'd call spiritual, people that are very grounded and not very interested in what goes on beyond this life, have no interest in the invisible world. And once I went to Delphi after the first day, the whole world opened up for me. It was amazing. Oh. Uh, it changed my perspective on uh, us being eternal beings. And I knew the potential we had to live any kind of life we wanted because I understood what I created. By the time I was 35, I had created a great business. And uh, by my family standards, by society standards, I was extremely uh, successful, but I was feeling empty. Mm. There was more to life I wasn't in touch with. And I knew that it, when I walked in nature or spent time just being contemplative, I was very happy. Yeah. And it was... a. A tough transition to be able to say I'm going to slow down in my life and start investigating the right brain in the invisible world because I was so addicted to the chatter in my head and the chatter in my head was what was running my life and I started seeing patients and doing workshops and I found that everyone else was dictated by the chatter in their head. You speak about the, the, the obstacles, the different kind of obstacles, like the roadblocks that we, that, that are just there, like feeling unlovable, feeling this guilt and shame, like all these things that we all experience as human beings. Do you, do you want to talk about some of them, like some of them that you had to overcome, for example, so we, we truly get how important that these are to look at? Well, the books we wrote really go through what, what I call the shrink's greatest hits. That's what everyone goes to a therapist for, basically. Yeah. And the first one is the obstacle of feeling unlovable. 
Because we're really in one of two modes. We're either living in our hearts and creating from our hearts mm. or creating from fear. We're shutting down somewhere. And so we developed a, a program that there are 12 obstacles to overcome, the first one being the lack of self-love. And I think everyone has this at one time or another. There's no question. And we're not in touch with it because we're acting arrogant or we're... Well, it, it manifests in so many different ways. You know when you're feeling unlovable. And it comes from our childhood scripts. You know, you could be the firstborn and you had all the attention and when you cried in your cradle, your parents ran to take care of you. And then your little brother was born two years later and suddenly you're not the focus of attention. So you think you're bad. You're not good enough. You don't know how to earn their love. And you do everything you can do to earn love because you don't deserve it anymore because you had unconditional love and it was distracted and taken away by your brother. It could be something that simple. But so it's, it all come. All those obstacles come from our past, right? Like even the gate, the the gate, the <laughs> the guilt and the shame. No. A lot of us feel that, like yeah, whether we do not, not enough or we feel never enough. We well, that's also cultural too. I mean, Catholics and Jews grow up with guilt and shame. Yeah. We're never good enough. We have to do more. We have to do twice as much to be like everyone else. Uh, it's a question of understanding what you should expect to do and what you're expected to do. What I'm not expressing this very well. It's an important point. We feel guilt and shame because people want us to be responsible for their happiness. Mm -hmm. You can't be responsible for anyone's happiness. And I do some couples therapy and, people, and, and uh, the wife or the husband says, you know, they should be doing more to make me happy. I don't understand it. Uh, I was feeling so down. And he didn't even come to me and ask what's wrong. I said, how did he know that was, there was anything wrong? Did you tell him you needed help? Well, no, but he should understand how I feel. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone's responsible for asking for help when they need help. Yeah. What is the right combination between this, these psychological questions and questioning our lives and ourselves and the energy work Uh, you know that we could do or I know you're into qigong and, and to energy medicine but what is is there, is there isn't there a balance to find there too well there's a balance to everything in life and it depends on the person who's uh, seeking that balance because everyone has their own unique energetic signature but it's important to have a daily dharma I don't care what you do but it has to be meaningful for you to be grounded yeah. and also connected So I go back to my triple A kind of personality if I don't do anything to calm down in the morning, the chatter may begin again. So either I meditate for a few minutes or I do an hour of Qigong. I, uh, it could be taking your dog for a walk. It could be anything that puts you in your heart, mm. mindfully in your heart. And I suggest to people to do at least uh, 10 gratitude statements to themselves before they get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. So they start their day at a high vibration. But we've developed all kinds of tools and techniques for guilt and shame, the obstacle of abandonment, the obstacle of stress, the obstacle of habit to overcome different habits, uh, the obstacle of heartbreak. And heartbreak is another thing that I just want to touch on as you're wearing pink and I'm wearing pink. Every day, little slights create heartbreak for people and they and it adds up and it it's like taking a shower every day you've got to get rid of it you've got to get rid of that energy because we're more than this physical body we have energetic bodies and it sort of gets stuck there so you need to do techniques to get it out of your energy system to get breathing it is it breathing in the field it could be breathing in it could be qigong It could be certain guided meditations that help do that. It could be... Uh, Trifinity. Tell us about Trifinity. Like this, you know, because I know you're all about those technologies too. It and could be the heart companion, yeah. which is an amazing tool, which you wear, which keeps you in your heart. The how, how does it do that? It uh, has sacred, a lot of sacred geometry, which attracts light. It uh, has sacred music. Jonathan Goldman has put a lot of music into it. It's connected to vortexes all over the world. There's a lot of different elements to it. 
did you get slowly into all these things uh, like uh, and we could speak about technology too or are the neuro phone even or the true infinity because you you get your hands into many things and you're this very curious you're you're I, you dig into it I'm curious but I found that I needed to have different techniques for different patients because everyone resonates to different things yeah. And I, coming from my old life, I think I never know enough. I have to learn more. And I still have a little bit of that. And I'm really curious about how everything works and how, how these uh, different um, tools can help us hold space while we do our own transition. Because they don't really uh, do the transition for you. They help you do the transition. Our tools and techniques in our books and on our website, we have over 200 articles, which are very helpful. But the first thing we tell people is you've got to do the work. You can't read the book. You can't read the article. You've got to do the work that we suggest that you may want to have a look at because everything is internal. You can't sit at the knees of a guru and, and transform. Yeah. You've got to do it yourself and you've got to do it every day. And being in just in only in our heart is not enough. Well, you're, you're either in expansion or contraction mode. And it's like your heart breathes. It's the way you breathe. You expand and you contract. Your heart isn't open 24-7. Some people walk around. I, my uh, co-author, Tracy Latz, is someone who's in her heart 24-7. I've never met anyone like her. She's a fabulous psychiatrist because of it. She's a wonderful teacher and a wonderful person. And her kids are very, very lucky to have her as a mother. But she's the only person I know who's always in her heart. But for the rest of us, the obstacle of stress comes up several times a day. And, you know, you go back into, oh, my God, how could that happen to me? You know, you go back into poor me. You go back into uh, fight or flight. You go back into the mind chatter. So as soon as that happens, you have to recognize it. Yeah. You have to, the point is to get all the tools and techniques you need to become the observer of your thoughts and know that you aren't your thoughts. Your thoughts just pass by like clouds. It's the thoughts you attach to and that you attach to repeatedly that become your beliefs. And you're the master of your thoughts. You can believe what you want to believe. You can create anything you want to create in your life. But you have to master your thoughts to be able to do that because the obstacles come up. Yeah. Let's, we have something called the bow and arrow theory. And the bow is the... Uh, Well, let's say the arrow is the goal. So how far back are you going to draw this bow? The bow is the heartfelt intention, or should be the heartfelt intention. So let's say my bow is, I have a heartfelt intention to lose weight and go on a diet. I'm taking my arrow back. The arrow is the thought. The thought is, oh my God, I see a brownie. How far is that arrow going to fly? You're not going to do much on your diet if your thought is overcoming your intention. Yeah. So your thoughts and your intentions need to be in alignment. Yeah. But most people go through their day, they don't even know what their thoughts are. They're driven by chatter. And they don't know what a, an intention is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But those 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 self sabotage uh, moments seem to be really really deeply deeply anchored in even yeah. or sometimes from past generations from past cultures lives. yes from past lives from past generations from childhood we're not aware of it so we don't create from the present moment so to become an observer of our thoughts and our actions you have to be in the present moment to do that because you want to create from this thought, this moment, this look in your face. You don't want to do it from anything that happened in the past and make it something that's reactive. You don't want to react to what happened in the past. You want every moment to be a new creation, a fresh creation, with all the potential and the juicy living possible for the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. But to stay in the present, you have to overcome the obstacles because... The obstacles will trip you up every time, and that's where we self-sabotage. Because we don't know that we have uh, a lack of self-love. We don't know that we're driven by guilt and shame. I, who knew that it, just going to the gym, I was driven by guilt and what it was doing to my body. I mean, it's just a very small example. Yeah. But it was changing my life. Yeah.
There seems to be a certain timing to this universe. It's like, okay, we won't change, but sometimes it's just not happening. We can become quite obsessional at it, trying to find solutions, but it's not coming. What is your view on, on this, how this universe works as far as the timing, where we're at? Are we really purely co-creating? Is there already something there for us, like a blueprint? Does destiny exist? Well, I think destiny exists in some form. I think the Earth is probably shifting to the next dimension and we're going to catch up with it. But we always have a choice. Yes. We can't overcome that. We, it's our choice how we want to participate in it. I think there are events that are greater than we are and we're part of a collective consciousness, but we have a choice within the realm of that collect collective consciousness as to what we are going to contribute, whether it's going to be positive, negative, whether it's going to be fearful or loving. Yes. And the more we're in our heart, the more, you know, your heart has two uh, toroidal fields and you're encompassing everyone around you. So you don't have to open your mouth. It's just what your heart is feeling you get people in your energy field and it helps them transform too, yeah. if yeah. that's their intention. So if we all went around understanding what it is to live in our hearts, we would be contributing in a fabulous way to the planet and the planet's ascension. Having said that, I would say 15 years ago, I didn't know the difference between a thought and a feeling. I was so much in my head that I would think that, oh, this is how I should feel, you know, how oh, I'm in love because the guy has this, that, you know, he makes me feel this way, that way, whatever it is. But I would think my feelings, I wasn't really in touch with my heart. So it's difficult to say to someone, get in your heart when they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. So we have lots of incredible meditations and tools and techniques like this and the Trinfinity 8, which get you out of your obstacles almost immediately so you can feel what it's like yeah. to be in your heart. A, a, a woman like you, you know, I want to hear how she's transforming the corporate world and all these huge structures because you have that. How, how do you go about it? Is that even part of what you, you want to create? Because there seems to be such a shift so needed in, 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 in these corporate uh, companies. Well, we'll be starting to teach in corporations probably in September. But another thing we teach... We taught the Girl Scouts. Tracy has been working with the Girl Scouts. And to teach kids to get into their hearts. The kids are already in their hearts until we socialize them and tell them this is bad, that's bad. Then they start questioning themselves. They start feeling guilty. They start feeling shameful that they're not doing what their parents want them to do, that they're not good enough at school. Uh, you know how kids can be very mean to each other. This is where all of those nasty childhood scripts start, usually when kids are in school. If you can start teaching kids to stay in their heart, to meditate, to get connected, that there is something greater than the chatter in their head, that's the key. It's not just corporate world, it's, it's kids. Yeah. And, and this the corporate world? You, you have to teach people that cooperation is much more important than competition that you can lift the whole company together. Because if you're competing for the next slot, as soon as you get to that slot, someone else is going to be competing for the same slot. So you're always in stress, and it's very hard to live in your heart when you're in constant stress and competition. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, and it, and it starts with the CEO, or can it really, are we in the era where it starts from all of us now instead of waiting on the tops to, to react? Well, it starts from the bottom and the top because if coworkers aren't out to kill each other to get ahead and they're working together, there's no reason to uh, dismiss them if people are really working as a team. Mm -hmm. But the idea would be to be a company with maybe 90 people so everyone is responsible and everyone can view everyone else as responsible because people will do their jobs if their peers are watching and if they feel part of a collective not if they're part of a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. When they're part of a hierarchy, they're just trying to move up the ladder mm -hmm. to get a better paycheck, to get more respect. You know, people are in corporations for a lot of uh, reasons, and uh, one of the major reasons is to get recognition. It's not just the money, it's to get recognition. Mm. So Which All human beings, that's common to all of us, probably, most of us. Absolutely, but especially also in the business world, because it's not about the paycheck, it's about, well, for some it is, but it's also the recognition, but it's also about team building. And I think there's much more team building going on now than ever before, that 
things are shifting and changing. I'd like to be more of a part of that, and I need to focus on that a little more. I've been focusing a lot on patience and writing. But uh, it's a great direction that more people should go into. So you juicy co-creators out there, go into the corporations and teach them cooperation. And and also social values. Uh But that's a whole other talk. What is your, because we can go on f- for, for a long time on, on, on all these topics, but is there something else that is really important for you to say or something that you see r- right now happening in this world or that you, or that you're or, or a wish or a call to action? Right. We're not, none of us are powerless. Mm. None of us are helpless. We all have the potential to use our gifts and abilities. The important thing is to find out what your gifts and abilities are. Find out what your passion and purpose is in life. Mm. And you can have a lot of different passions and purposes, but you have to put yourself on the track to know what feels good, to know what makes your heart sing. And you don't do anything that doesn't make your heart sing. You can find something to do. And if you have a problem with that, we have lots of articles about that on our website. But when you find your passion and purpose, when you're in alignment with who you really are, set goals, know where you want to go, Write them down. Give yourself a timeline. And don't say, I want a new Mercedes. You know, you want to... uh, Go to the core of being of who you are to understand what that goal is. Dig deep down into your heart. And I think a lot lot of people will find that they do want to be of service in some way. And when you are of service and you're in alignment, the universe will conspire to make you very, very successful. Mm. But you can't let any obstacle get in your way. And when obstacles do get in the way, you have to clear them daily. So it's not about having goals and dreams. It's about writing down those goals and dreams and taking massive action in a very organized way. Consciously. You have to be conscious every day. And you have to be the observer of your actions because it's easy to get into anger and resentment, guilt and shame, unlovability on the path because the path is not linear. It's work. But it should be joyful work. Mm. And when you encounter a roadblock, it's normal. Mm. Just say detour, go around the detour and get back on track. But without a map, you're lost because any road will get you there. (laughs) You have to know where you're going. Okay, beautiful Marion, thank you so much for this interview and, and this time. I'm so excited to share this online for everybody to hear this all around the world and we can continue on this beautiful path and, 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 and support each other in this because we need a, a daily reminders of this, of what's really going on. Thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you, all juicy co-creators, sending you so much love from beautiful south of France and Grasse. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.